Hello, beautiful San Francisco. I love being alive. How about you? Are you digging it? Yeah. OK. Well, what I haven't said yet publicly before is that, unfortunately, I have a terminal illness. And it's forming a backdrop to my daily life. And that illness is aging. You got that one too? <laughs> OK, together on that. So I should be reasonable and buck up, deal with it like a mature person. Reasonable. <sighs> So reasonably, I think I have three alternatives. One, I could die painlessly, unexpectedly, quickly. And it wouldn't be so bad, right? Unfortunately, that is the absolute worst outcome for people you care about and love. They have the highest chance of dying of, of illnesses immediately afterward, especially for people very close, or of having post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, number two. Uh, you could die predictably, painfully, slowly. That's actually the best for the people you care about. <sighs> so the third alternative, unreasonable. Dylan Thomas poignantly, somewhat ironically, wrote about his recently departed father. Do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. That's how I feel about it. So why not? We are in an age now where biological technology is taking off so incredibly rapidly that it is now within the grasp of technology within our lifetimes to figure out how biology works, the mechanisms of aging, and be able to deal with that disease. But is that such a good idea? You may have some problems with that. First of all, it's not natural. It's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to die. Everybody dies. All animals die. Everything has died forever. Aging is natural. Is aging natural? What if in a seven-year-old child with an accelerated aging disease called progeria, they're developing the aging symptoms of a 70-year-old? then that's tragic, and it should be treated humanely. But that's just a time span difference. So why, when I'm 70, are they saying, oh, well, he was old? Looking at the last couple of hundred years, technology has been improving our lifespan gradually, predictably, steadily. We look back in a time when there were no antibiotics, Parents gathered around the deathbed of their child, watching it slowly be consumed of some bacterial disease, eating it bit by bit, last few moments of life. That's barbaric from this perspective. Give the kid antibiotics. That's immoral. That's humane. Zooming out, looking forward, I believe we will look back on a time now when we had no anti-aging therapies and think, how barbaric, all these beautiful people rotting away from the inside. Some other problems. What about overpopulation? If everybody lives forever, won't the planet be completely full and it'll turn into a Mad Max post-apocalyptic hell? Consider fertility. This is a graph of fertility rate on the vertical and wealth and security on the horizontal. At the top, we have Niger, the poorest. Many, many children being born. Extremely high birth rate, very, very low security. The world is in the center, just coincidentally, slightly above the green line, which says that's the constants, constant population line. At the other extreme, Switzerland. Um, you got a Switzerland out there? Switzerlander? Awesome. Um, uh, wealth, we have um, low fertility rate, 
Extrapolate this graph a little farther, and you'll see that the higher someone's security, the less they feel an urgency to reproduce. And this will bring the world into, back into equilibrium. Perhaps you know a close woman friend who wasn't quite sure whether she wanted to have children. And then the biological alarm clock goes off. Well, I better have one now because then I'll lose my chance. Imagine being able to defer your childbearing years to a more convenient time. Grow up a little bit more. Another 100 years? <laughs> Why not? So I'm talking about extending the healthy lifespan of the human being. Keeping your youthful body, your functional body, to do whatever kinds of crazy things you want to do with it. Maybe you'll die of them, but that's your business. I'm talking about getting rid of the inexorable things, the disease called aging. So the number of theories about how aging works, do I subscribe to one of them in particular? There's the wear and tear theory, the genes, different animals live for different times, there's something there, hormonal programming, mitochondrial theory of aging. Actually, all of the above, these things are all true. It's a complex, mixed process. Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Foundation lays it out in a simple structure where you have metabolism, that's the normal functioning of the body. And as the normal functioning, there's garbage created, there's junk in the cells and protein cross-linking, and that's what he calls damage. And eventually, that, well, that's fine while you're young. There's lots of room in your cells, and it's fine for me now, mostly. But as it builds up and the trash hasn't taken out, then you start getting problems, pathology. Then you get loss of elasticity of your tissues. Your organs start failing. You become frail. This is, this is not the, the, uh, the later life that I'm envisioning. I'm talking about youthful lifespan. So a lot of money and effort, and we've heard about this. Um, valiant, noble people work in geriatrics. And that is, the damage is occurring, and you're trying to minimize the suffering and delay the diseases that are occurring into the pathology. You could help a bit. On the other end, you have gerontology tackling the effects of metabolism, trying to understand metabolism and decrease its ability to create the damage in the first place. Very, very complicated problem. This is a view of just one part of the metabolic pathways in one of our cells, and nobody understands this. Some people understand little pieces of it. Long-term project. So is it impossible to figure out? 15 years ago, Gunter Wagner at Yale came to the realization that, well, this is related to the reason we love sex. It seems obvious, but it's actually because Evolution likes us to have evolution. The faster you can evolve, the better you can survive. The best way to evolve and mix up your genes and have adaptability is to trade genes back and forth around. That's sex, plus some other window dressing. Another thing that's really good for adaption, he figured out, is modularity. That one system can be independent of another system. You can change this system without breaking this system. Therefore, you can innovate and grow another arm when you need to. And if you have one cluster of genes pertaining mostly to one function and another cluster to a different function and not as many cross-links, then the system is modular. And then it's more like the way we design things, and it's more like something we can understand and less like chaos theory, which is undecipherable, provably. So the solution by, proposed by Aubrey de Grey is to repair the damage in the middle. There's some junk in the cells. Go in there and clean it out. A bunch of different ways of doing this. He calls that sins. So that sounds a great, like a great plan. Is there enough time? What about for us, me, our loved ones? Well, times are different now than they have been, and they're getting differenter in the future. Think differenter? Uh, this is a graph of computing power, of the most powerful computers over time. And vertically, it's an exponential graph, which means every one of those lines is 10 times more powerful. Ray Kurzweil made this, 
in 2005, and the blue, the blue line was, were predictions that came out perfectly well. And then I added today's fastest supercomputer, which is in China, the Tiana one a and somewhere in there belongs Watson Jeopardy. And looking along that continued projection, we see that it's not very many years now between, before the fastest computer in the world has as much processing power as a human brain. And then not that many more years after that, that the fastest computer in the world can completely simulate a human brain at the neuron level. So that's guaranteed to be able to simulate. Somewhere in between, we're going to find some humans that think better than computers. That's one way that's going to help us decipher and unravel the mystery of metabolism. Biological technology is also exponentially growing. This is a laboratory and a chip. It looks a lot like semiconductors. Hmm? This is a DNA microarray. In one afternoon, one researcher using this machine can conduct almost 40,000 experiments, doing as much biological exploration as all of the biologists in the world in that afternoon 15 years before. And many other techniques being worked on in parallel. Nanotechnology, microscopic robots in your bloodstream to go into your cells and clean them out. If there isn't time for you, some of us are closer to the deadline than others, be frozen in ni liquid nitrogen and wait until our technology catches up with you. Gene therapy, indeed, in our genes is our destiny, unless we change our genes or change the way our genes are transcribed into ourselves. There's regenerative stem cell therapy. So, yeah, what about you? What about us? Let's say right now, our technology, you saw that curve of increasing lifespan, gives you about 84 years. How are you doing on that 84 years? Are you getting closer to the end? How much time you got left? You get, you know, maybe some of you are in there, or some of us are getting older, getting closer, but technology is racing along. So maybe five years go by, and you get an extra two years. That helps a little bit. An extra five years go by, and maybe four years more. Okay, that helps more. Maybe 10 years go by, and 10 years are added. That's accelerating technology. Now you're kind of like almost getting hopeful. And then 12 years. And that point, escape velocity. You're home free. So what about wisdom? And we heard about our elders earlier. Unfortunately, our elders are dying young. I'm talking about real elders. Imagine a world in which our people who, just as they're becoming wise, don't die off, but they are hundreds of years old and can remember the mistakes of the past and not repeat them. Imagine a world in which we are not distracted by getting to work on time to get that retirement nut so we can have enough money to not be slowly growing frail while we're poor. But thinking about longer term problems, bigger problems that's, that face all of this, like developing the technology to steer meteors away from the Earth before they completely destroy it, perhaps 500 years hence. I started off thinking computers are the coolest thing in the world and not thinking about biological technologies at all. Then I went to Harvard because I wanted to build even, even more powerful computer. And at the time, the idea of building one out of biological components seemed really darn cool. So, and I learned a lot about biology and realized it's really fun. It's like an intellectually stimulating uh, area, and there's a lot of diversity to it. That's fun for me. And then much later, after, after getting all of this biological education, I started realizing this is kind of doable. Biology is a mechanical, technological system. And we can hack it. What I'm doing for that is I'm working at a company called Halcyon Molecular in Redwood City, about 50 people, startup. And DNA sequencing right now is in a terrible state. It's very, very inaccurate. It's slow. It's super expensive. 
And yes, our destiny is written in our genes. Aging is inscribed in our genes. And in order to understand how to change our genes or change the way they're expressed, we have to understand our genes. And we don't. We don't understand this stuff. So we need, as Richard Feynman said, if you don't understand a problem, build a machine to look at it. So we're working on sequencing human DNA using electron microscopes. And it's a lot of fun. So you have two choices. You get option one, do uh, work on curing aging now. Or you can work on option two, a random fun project. And option one, you do another random fun project. And option two, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then option one, another fun project. OK. So here we have everyone, all of us. A lot of us don't recognize that this is possible to cure aging. That leaves these are those of us on the left. Some others of us don't think that it's necessarily, aren't sure that it's necessarily a good idea. And then this small little bit of us right now are actually doing something about it. And I would like more people to join us in that project. Imagine a world of romance. Can you imagine a difference where presently romance involves marriage? You get together with someone, you have a great time for a while, then you start to degenerate. One of you dies. The other one's left alone, bereft, with post-traumatic stress disorder, and then it's over. Imagine love that is forever. I love you forever, and we will strive for that. And you believe it when you say it. Imagine a world which you have the romance of the 100 years that it takes to travel to the nearest star. Imagine a world in which people who are looking at sustainability can really believe and feel and imagine that they will be part of this Earth in 300 years. How is that going to affect how we care for this Earth and each other? Thank you.